This is a recording of the latest meeting with PIARC Advisory Group, where we discussed COVID-19 actions and trends at our invited partner organizations. The PIARC Advisory Group consists of international organizations on invitation by PIARC. The membership is semi-fixed and varies based on topic and availability for the meeting. The purpose of the advisory group is to help PIARC in analysis of novel topics, and we usually discuss recent activities at the invited organizations and in PIARC, uh, trends in the road sector, and we also work together to identify and progress joint activities. We meet once or twice a year, often in conjunction with other major international events. And if you want to get in touch with us, please don't hesitate to reach out to us on this email address. Since the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has great impact on road transport and infrastructure, PR has set up a response team to support knowledge sharing and promote exchanges between our members. The response team consists of members from our technical committees and national committees, and it is led by Patrick Malijak, PRC's Secretary General. As part of our response to the pandemic, PRC highlights relevant reports. We produce a series of webinars addressing various topics. We publish notes that summarize the main conclusions and trends that we currently see emerging from the pandemic. And all of our products, recordings of the webinars, and the latest news are accessible from our dedicated webpage to COVID-19 response. Now follows short presentations from the invited organizations that took part in our last advisory group meetings, where they address recent activities and trends uh, related to COVID-19. The presentations you will see come from the following organizations in the following order. We will start with a presentation by Hector Varela from CAF, the Development Bank of Latin America, followed by Franz Jess Gross from World Bank, Nining Wang from China Highway and Transportation Society, Susana Samataro from International Road Federation, Jeffrey Paniati from Institute of Transportation Engineers, Ivo Cre from Police Network, Neil Peterson from TRB Transport Research Board, Mohamed Mesgani from UITP, Jim Walker from Walk21, and Per Mathiasen, European Investment Bank. Good afternoon, everyone. This is a presentation about CAF actions in the development of Latin American roads. Uh, I would like to talk about CAF, our main areas of work in roads, vision, challenge, and our strategic relation with PR. Uh, CAF is a development bank whose mission is to promote sustainable development and regional integration in Latin America. The bank raises resources in international markets, which are later used to finance projects mainly in the public sector in Latin America and the Caribbean. The bank also provides technical cooperation, generates knowledge, and provides other specialized service to its public sector clients. CAF is unusual in that not a single shareholding country, regardless of the site or capital contribution, has more votes than the other countries at the board of directors. As it is the case of the Inter-American Development Bank or the Asian Development Bank. Instead, the vote is divided equally among countries, all of which can be considered developing, developing nations. CAF was found by five countries in the Andean zone, Bolivia, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Venezuela. Later, it took, on, it, it took on other countries in the region. Currently, CAF membership is made up of 19 countries. 11 of them are full members, while another eight have second type of membership, including Spain and Portugal. CAF's work on the road sector, please, can you go to the fourth slide? Yes, that's right. CAF's work on the road sector is part of its mission to promote sustainable development and regional integration financing the public and private sectors and providing support through technical cooperation. CAF's 
focus is project financing, especially in the sovereign guaranteed public sector, the destination of more than 80% of a total portfolio of $25 billion. Within the financing to the public sector, the financing of highway projects stands out with more than $5 billion disbursed. Approximately two thirds of this amount has been allocated to interurban roads and one third to urban roads. CAF also finance roads with the involvement of the private sector and has an important portfolio on PPP projects, either through direct finance from CAF or indirectly through more sophisticated services such as CAFAM. Technical cooperation focuses mainly on institutional support, training, and the generation of applied knowledge. In the case of technical assistance involving roads, this has been strongly linked in achieving a better use of resources by governments. Next slide, please. Um, about our, our vision. Roads in Latin America are located in a complex context. There are large distances to be linked between the agricultural, agricultural producing areas and the large centers of demand. Also, transport links must cross areas of difficult geology and often hit by heat adverse weather events. Also, there are institutional, social, and economic weakness. This is eventually reflect in the construction and maintenance of networks, which end up with low coverage and bad quality, resulting in high substantial transport costs and rather high accident rates. This is clearly reflected in the analysis presented, presented, presented on this slide. The level of road infrastructure investment in the region is well below the world's average and at the bottom of regions in the world. The world's average road infrastructure investment per capita is $6,045, while in Latin America is $2,180 per capita. You can, you can see this diagnostic in our website in the link attached. Next slide, please. Okay, these circumstances make us build a strategic vision involving road infrastructure, infrastructure based on three pillars. The uncertainty in the future, created by the COVID-19 pandemic, the high level of complexity involving the prioritization of investment in the road sector, and without a doubt, to face the first two points just mentioned, the evolution of governance is key. Next slide. We believe our main challenge for the future are promote increasing investment to achieve a less 200% increasing investment in ground transportation, to reduce the infrastructure gap and support economic recovery. Um, Strength, strengthen the processes with a long-term view in promoting efficiency through a planning culture, an evaluation culture, and a culture of maintenance, and incorporate new technologies with the aim of improving productivity and transparency in the construction sector. And continue with the generation and dissemination of knowledge, for example, massive offline, online open course. Finally, in the last slide, uh, I would like to talk about CAF and PR the strategic relation. We want to continue CAF's contribution from road specialists in the PR technical committees. To continue, to continue events co-organization in Latin America, taking the 2019 Asset Management Seminar in Querétaro, in Querétaro Mexico, as an example. Work together in dissemination of, of knowledge, such as the series of six massive online open course about the road infrastructure provision cycle that we are working together. Inside, and inside this relation, the CAF's participation in the PR advisory group and in the DKBA meetings. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hector. Thank you very much. And next up, we have World Bank France. 
Yes, good afternoon in uh, Europe. Hi, Patrick. Hi, Anna. Kevin. Hi, everybody who's participating. I'm Franz Dries Gross. I'm the Dr Regional Director for Infrastructure in the World Bank, covering the Latin America and Caribbean region. And I'll talk in more general terms today about the impact of COVID on the transport subsectors. Next slide, please. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about how COVID is impacting public transport, aviation, global supply chains, and then more specifically road transport, since this is, of course, a, a PR conference. Next, please. So this is uh, data drawn from MoveIt. Here we see the evolution of public transport ridership across the world. Uh, I've selected a, a section of um, developing and developed country cities around the world. But what you can see is basically over for the last four months, a downturn in public transport ridership of about 65 to 90 percent. In Brazil, it's about 65 percent. In places like Lima, it's about 95 percent. In many cities around the world, it's closer to the 90s. And what we see is that even when the lockdowns are lifted, public transport ridership recovers slowly. Even in China, in Wuhan, for example, or in Beijing, it's recovered slowly because people, of course, are afraid to get back on um, public transport systems. So what are we doing about this? We're, first of all, sharing good operational practices with Shenzhen, uh, Beijing, Seoul, with counterparts all over the world, but also talking to governments around the world about lines of credit for public transport companies that are on the verge of collapse. Lines of credit, but also guarantees to try to leverage in some private financing to these public transport operators, given the multiple demands on scarce fiscal space right now. Next slide. Here we see what's happening to the aviation sector. The light blue bars on the far left of each of the regions is basically the situation in January. The dark blue one on the right of each cluster is what the situation looked like in April. And you can see right now in all regions, international seat capacity aviation travel is down 95, close to 100%, but about 95% worldwide. If you look at domestic transport, that's the right graph. You can see a slight recovery in, um, in uh, China for domestic transport since they lifted their lockdown. But most regions look more like the US with very, very depressed, very low levels of domestic transport, perhaps at 10% uh, of what it was before. Next slide, please. And here's a very worry worrying one. What's happening to merchandise trade? Um, if you look, the gray dotted line on the left is basically the trend line for trade. Uh, trade volumes between 2000 and 2010. Then the yellow dotted line is basically 2010 to 20. So it was already a, a slower, a lower slope. And then the bolded lines, basically the, the, the red one and the green one are different scenarios. So the World Bank were projecting a downturn in trade somewhere between 13 and 32% for calendar year 2020. So a giant downturn. And the big question is, do you return to trend like that yellow dotted line in, um, in calendar 21, something more like the green one, that's what we hope for, or a much slower recovery, the red one. On the right side, you see the way different countries around the world color-coded by the time they took measures to restrict medical uh, exports. That's a very worrying trend. And what you don't see, for example, here is that in Africa, 22 countries have completely shut their borders. So there's at least 35 million people being fed by a World Food Program right now in Africa and other, others who are at acute risk of famine in Africa because with the border shutdowns, essential goods, food, medicines, et cetera, are not getting through. So unless those border uh, shutdowns are um, eased very quickly, we may have a, a very, very dire uh, supply situation. Next slide, please. Now, let me tell you a little bit, focus on the road sector. What are we doing about this? Next, please. So one thing we're looking very carefully is how does um, how does the COVID crisis impact the road sector? Well, one very clear way is that many countries who've been successful at attracting private financing for toll roads, of course, are seeing those PPPs under stress right now. So let me just take an example. It's on the bottom of the screen. If you have a highway PPP, suddenly you have a reduction of toll revenues because the, uh, the number of vehicles traveling on roads is so much slow, lower with the, the lockdown. Now that could mean Two things: either it's the private concessionaire that's suffering losses, or the private or the public side is uh, basically has provided some kind of a revenue guarantee under the PPP and is now on the hook to provide support to the private operators. So, how can we prevent these concessions all from going belly up and declaring force majeure? 
there's a couple of options. You can, of course, lengthen the concession periods and give the private sector a longer period in which to recover its investment. You can offset set the downturn in toll revenues with government payments, but very few developing country governments have the fiscal space for that. You can backload investment requirements. So there's many things that we're working with countries around the world right now, talking to them about how, how to save some of these road transport concessions and allowing them to survive this uh, the COVID downturn. Next slide, please. So what I also want to say is now we're looking, talking to a lot of governments that are starting to emerge from lockdowns is how can they restart their economy with fiscal stimulus? This is on the left, you see um, the number of jobs created for $1 billion public investment stimulus. This is a study done in Latin America in 2009 after the global financial crisis. And the reason I put it up, I thought you'd be interested to see that basically rural road maintenance is the best way to create short-term jobs with low income earners. So basically a billion dollars spent on rural road maintenance generates 250 to 500,000 jobs. Water only about 100,000 jobs. Highways about 10,000 jobs because there's a greater spend on asphalt and other materials. And energy generation investments even less because of the expensive equipment purchases. So this is something to consider. This may be a moment as countries emerge from lockdown to the extent that they have money to stimulate their economy to use rural road maintenance and perhaps also highway expenditure to create unemployment, especially in the hardest hit areas. Thanks to everyone. And I can stay for another five minutes and then I'll have to connect to another meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Franz. Uh, so since you have to leave, maybe we should make an, an exception here and see if there's anyone who has a comment or a question to you before you need to leave. So let's take a, a few minutes break here and, and see if there is anyone who has a comment or question for, for Franz. Uh, I have a comment. Um, Ivo here for a question like you, you talked about different uh, transport modes of course uh, how do you prioritize or how, how does the, um, the the bank look at the importance and the, the hierarchy between these modes or is it an, an operational difference different units different budgets different modes or or is it an, an uh, also an, an an exercise of understanding where the the need is is biggest that's a great question are there any others or should we just answer this one Anna karen patrick here uh, i have a question if i may, if i may uh, we see that some of our members in Iraq are now considering the more medium-term impact of the crisis in terms of what kind of investments should they prioritize in the future and what you've presented really resonates very well with that so i would like to venture that maybe we could uh, uh team up on this one uh, somehow i don't know how to be honest uh but uh i would be very happy to share with you what our plans for next webinars or whatever are and maybe you, you could find it interesting to join that uh, we have one next week on urban transport and one the week after that on uh, many topics related uh, to Latin American countries in particular. But we'll, we'll be in touch on this one. And we also have one last question from Brendan Helena from IRF Global. Uh, is there a risk that COVID recovery efforts will crowd out other pressing issues for the World Bank, such as road safety, road sector reform, etc.? Excellent. Thanks so much. Excellent questions. Let me begin with Patrick's question. Just say, we'd be delighted to work with you. So this is an older study, the one that's currently on the slide, basically the world after the 2008-9 financial crisis and employment generation for all of Latin America. So what you really need to do is customize that country by country in those countries that are thinking of using infrastructure investment as part of a stimulus package. So we're taking that now and basically in Argentina, for example, which is, of course, suffering a crisis within a crisis and seeing what does that mean for the government. And again, this is only one lens through which to look at public investment, which is you know, the employment benefits. Of course, there's also the economic rate of return, the social impact, regional equity, but this is one, one lens that's useful. Uh, let me just then talk about Christian's question and Evo's. How do you prioritize within modes, between modes? Well, first, when we lend to countries, they have an overall lending uh, borrowing envelope, just as they do with CAF. I Hector talked a little bit about this, but you know, essentially we don't tell them you have to invest in infrastructure versus schools or healthcare, et cetera. And of course, right now, many countries are using 
central bank funds to respond <clears throat> to the immediate healthcare crisis. So they basically decide what to use their borrowing envelopes within the World Bank for. Now, that said, what we say is in whatever sectors that they do want to intervene, what would be a smart way to do so that uses public money in the most sparing form possible? Because right now, the, com the competing demands on public finances are so huge. I mean, transport is only one tiny little subsector. You know, everybody's got their hand out right now, and with good reason. People have lost their jobs, health clinics that, you know, aren't staffed, et cetera, et cetera. So what we say is, well, if you're going to bail out um, PPP highway concessions, here's a smart way to do it that is light on the fiscal purse, right? Stretch the concession periods. Um, reduce the investment uh, um, requirements, or basically stretch them out in time. And just to try to think how you can use the minimum of public money to save them. Now, within the public transport uh, modes, of course, we're particularly worried about the, the demise of uh, urban public transport. We've had, you know, gains trying to reduce emissions um, and therefore, you know, transport right now is 15% of global greenhouse gas emissions. But there's a real risk of what's called revenge pollution. As we saw after the 2008 financial crisis is that you have a one year or two year dip in emissions followed by emissions coming roaring back. So we're very worried about public transport in particular because we don't want the ridership to basically drop off and people to move back to cars. So we're pushing very hard for, you know, trying to make public transport systems safe, but also developing more active mobility, more bike cats, et cetera, so that people who are still afraid to go back to public transport at least don't go to cars and use bikes more often. Um, and then are we, you know, we're still committed. There's no change in our commitment to road safety. So, for example, every project, if a government does decide to use its envelope on highways, we will make sure that those highways meet our road safety standards, right? So we're not gonna walk away from that, but the financing will be dictated by how countries prioritize within their envelopes. Thank you. Thank you, Franz. Um, if there's no other questions or comments on this, we shall move on to the next organization, which is Frida, China Highway and Transportation Society. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you so much for inviting CHTIs to join this meeting. And now I'm going to introduce Brita and some activities on behalf of Nina and uh, the Brita. Okay, next, please. Hello? Next? Okay. Next one. Okay. Yeah, as you know, Brita is a non profit and non governmental international organization. And we mainly do, we mainly do, okay. Hello? Okay, we mainly do projects and the activities to build the uh, exchange platform and to promote transport cooperation, especially in the heavy sector. Okay, I, I think I can do without that. <laughs> Thanks to the three years of hard work of my dear colleague, Brita now has many uh, members. We have uh, 125 applicants from 41 nations and 53 from China. We believe that with so many uh, members, we can make life easier and wonderful by uniting all the members together and to make something, make some changes in transport. Okay, can you, uh, next one, please. Now Brita has three committees. We mainly do our work through the three committees, but uh, the three committees are ITS Committee, uh, Green and Sustainable Transport Committee, and also the, uh, the uh, Road Safety Committee. But soon we will have the fourth committee, that is the Bridge Technical Committee. It will be released on June 19, 2020. Okay, next one, please. I will introduce some activities by Brita. Uh, Brita has organized many uh, events, of which the most important one is the uh, WTC, World Transport Convention. The WTC has uh, has been held, uh, held its inaugural international conference on June 4th, uh, 2017, and held the annual convention in 2018 and 2019. Every session we have over 5,000 participants. It provides a very good platform for the world to know China's uh, transport. Okay, next one, please. Besides, we also have other uh, activities, such as the China Africa Infrastructure International Transport Symposium, and also the Brita Plenary Meeting. I'm sure most of the 
attendees at this PIAC advisory group meeting are invited to the WTC. Can we move on to the events to be organized? Uh, okay, I'm, I'm just telling, uh, introduce the events to be organized. That is the most important part of the of my PPT. Uh, in June 19, 2020, we will hold the Brita board meeting. Now, actually, we are uh, planning for that. And then we will have the International Forum on the Transport Cooperation. I'm sorry, everyone. I, it seems that we have a bad connection to, uh, to Ningning. So I, I think we will, we will move on as to not lose time. Um, I hope that you can hear me, Ningning. Sorry for all these uh, issues. Thank you very much for your presentation. And we will move on to our next organization, which is, I will just get your slides. IRF, Susanna. Thank you, Anna Karin. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you very clear. Yes, hello everyone again. Uh, Susanna Zamataro, International Road Federation in uh, Geneva. I'd like to start by thanking uh, Payak for the opportunity um, that uh, it has provided today for all of us uh, to meet. I would say that um, instigating and, and facilitating partnership uh, partnerships is really the DNA of, uh, of IRF. So we welcome any initiative that allows us uh, from the sector, all of us in the sector to uh, coordinate and hopefully also to collaborate in the future. Next slide, please, uh, Anna Karin. Um, I think I know most of the people in the um, in the call, but two words in case there's newcomers uh, here. Uh, we are an independent, not-for-profit organization uh, operating and serving uh, the roads and more recently uh, the mobility sector for the past uh, 72 years. Memberships uh, spanning uh, from public sector, so ministries or government agencies, a lot of private sector, but also research uh, institutes. Um, and um, I would say activities, plenty of different activities, uh, all organized around three, uh, what we call the three strategic uh, pillars, knowledge and expertise, um, sharing and dissemination, the, the networking, so the connections and, and policy advocacy work. Next one, please. The first, um, the first um, update, uh, making our selection, given that we only have five minutes for this. Um, IRF is a steering committee member of the Sustainable Mobility for All, an initiative which is led by the World Bank and rallies around the table 55 organizations uh, from the transport, uh, transport uh, sector, some of them as well in this call, uh, DFID, UITP and others. Um, in the new uh, phase of, of, of work of uh, Some for All, IRF is uh, currently co-leading uh, together with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, the new working group on data sharing for sustainable uh, urban uh, mobility. It's a piece of work that looks at um, how do we create um, policy frameworks uh, that will enable data sharing uh, for urban mobility. Next one, please. Why uh, this interest uh, in data, of course, well, data is the new oil, as everybody says, but IRF has also 56 years of, of experience in uh, collecting data from, uh, from the sector. Uh, more, many of you will be familiar with the IRF World Road Statistics that cover 208 countries, uh, most important um, thing probably for you to know is the third bullet point. These data are collected not from the internet but from primary statistical offices. So through a network of that we have built over the past 56 years with ministries, the road authorities, national statistical offices. And we do use the definitions of uh, the glossary of transport statistics, which is uh, defined by the ITF Eurostat in UNICE. It's another fundamental point because of course, anyone who knows uh, a little bit of data, it's important that um, that uh, we, we, uh, we compare apple with apples. Let me put it like this. Next one, please. The, probably uh, important update for you to know um, as far as our data are concerned, thanks to the support of the Total uh, Foundation, uh, we have uh, launched in February uh, in Stockholm, in fact, the IRF Global Road Data Warehouse. Uh, we have uh, basically built a, a digital platform on which we have now all our uh, time, uh, time series. 
and it's a tool that allows us as well well first of all to the users as well to um, analyze data and and consult data more uh, easily it's um, uh, it, it's also the the platform has a number of, of, of different um, new functionalities that allow you as well uh, to visualize and compare um, data it has been uh, built in a way that um, um, other data sets uh, out there can be plugged uh, uh, plugged in and in this we'll be um, happy to explore uh, anyone um, potential collaboration with anyone on this call who is interested um, in uh, taking a look at the data warehouse and what we have and how we can join hands. Next slide. And we, on the top of that, uh, we have also created a series of uh, dashboards. Uh, the ones that you see on the screen is just an example of dashboards we have done specifically on, uh, on road safety and which were presented um, uh, in uh, in uh, Stockholm. Um, part of this work, in fact, uh, will be uh, helping and supporting the work um, of the road safety observatories, regional road safety ob observatories um, that are being built uh, both in Africa and Southeast Asia. Next slide, please. It's just an example of the global one and the country one. Next one, please. Now, capacity building is also, I would say, one of the major uh, pillar of, of around which we organize our activities, capacity building that we try to bring to the countries themselves. So we have been doing some, some interesting work uh, using the uh, network of the Global Alliance of, um, of NGOs for road safety. So we did some um, multi-stakeholders capacity building on data in uh, Africa. We do work with Total. Um, trying to pull, to, uh, pull together as well the uh, efforts of the private sector when it comes to road safety and building in-country road safety coalitions. We do have long-standing collaborations with the T2 centers in Africa and specifically the one in, in uh, Tanzania with the University of Birmingham and, and Qatar University as well to deliver professional uh, courses in the countries and in the region. Um, I'm happy to see Rob uh, probably speaking after me, so I'm anticipating if we will be touching upon this. Uh, we have the pleasure of um, uh, working with IRAP, IARC, and um, the United Com uh, UNECA, so United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, on one of the 10th uh, uh, projects that have been uh, selected and announced uh, during Stockholm. It's, uh, it's a project that will be piloting um, the framework that you see in this publication on the right-hand side of, of the slide, the 10 steps plan for safer road infrastructure. We'll be piloting that in, uh, in Tanzania with the Tanzania uh, authorities as well. Last but not least, uh, we have also launched, and I was particularly welcome in this period of, of lockdown, new online training courses on sustainability next one two words uh, on the other side of the of, on the side of more innovation we just launched an IRF committee on connected and autonomous mobility it's a committee that will try and and well the focus is is uh, pretty much on infrastructure because we felt there was a gap um, uh, in, in that respect, but we are also federating a number of other initiatives under this uh, unique umbrella with the uh, intention to really coordinate uh, a little bit the sector. Uh, another important information, we are part of the big uh, 69 consortium uh, uh, that will be delivering the show project. It's the biggest EU demonstration project on automation and uh, it's on urban mobility and I'm happy Mohammed uh, is on the line because UITP is leading that effort. Next slide, and I think it's the last one. On the coronavirus, four important uh, update for you. Um, IRF is working since weeks with its own uh, members. We're finalizing uh, what we call an IRF position paper that will outline a vision and providing some suggestions on the way forward, especially um, for the recovery post uh, COVID-19 and um, to uh, provide some answers uh, or our point of view on some of the things that uh, France from the World Bank was uh, mentioning uh, before. Like anyone else, indeed, trying to uh, support the sector through webinars. Um, and uh, as Diffid was saying, we're also trying to um, well, support and bring the attention uh, to low and middle income countries. We do think that's uh, still too little, uh, which is being done uh, for that part of the, of the world. There will be a first one on the 10th of June, together with the South African Transport um, Conference and a couple of others that will be following up.
Important information, IRF is also an IRF Africa board. It's an advisory committee, a little bit like the one uh, we are in the call today, uh, made up of uh, the major stakeholders, uh, institutional and not in, uh, in Africa. We'll be meeting with them on the 15th of June, in fact, to exchange ideas and, and to make sure that um, we do align um, activities and response uh, in a way that really helps uh, low and middle income countries. In terms of uh, resources, uh, we do support, we're members of Slow Cut and a Sustainable Mobility for All, who so have been channeling all the resources through these two, um, these two uh, channels, but also filtering uh, the, uh, the information a little bit for our membership because when there's uh, uh, so much information, it's like not having information. So uh, we'll probably do something else uh, going forward um, on that one as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susanna. And um, next up after you is actually ITE. So Jeffrey, the floor is yours. Great, thank you very much. And I appreciate the opportunity to be with all of you. Um, just a quick update on ITE, a reminder, you know, we're a professional and technical association. We have 16,000 members, uh, mostly based in North America, Australia, New Zealand, although we have members in 75 countries and are very strong in Canada. So certainly we'll want to talk with Patrick with you about the uh, upcoming Winter Congress and how we might uh, be able to support that. Our members are typically transportation engineers, but also transportation planners, policy makers, um, and technologists. And so we consider ourselves a community of transportation professionals. And we produce the range of technical reports, standards. Uh, we do a lot of professional development meetings. We grant professional certifications. And we were established in 1930. So this year is our 90th anniversary. Our initiatives focus on issues such as vision zero, mobility as a service and mobility on demand, the intersection of transportation and health, connected and automated vehicles. And this year we have a special focus on big data and data analytics and how to leverage uh, data in, into operations by our members. What I thought I would do today is focus on ITE's response to COVID-19 and particularly look at some of the impacts and implications of COVID-19 on transport and travel in the United States. Next slide. So in terms of IT's response to COVID-19, we've done a number of things. Uh, we've created a curated resource page and I'll show you the link to that at the end of the presentation. We felt it was best to try to um, capture information that was being produced by a wide range of organizations and organize it for our members in these four categories. So information on transportation, the information on the impacts on travel, uh, information that would be useful to organizations, both public and private sector, and then information that individuals could use in their own um, safety and that of their family. We've done some deeper dives into topics that we think are particularly relevant right now. For example, we did a podcast looking at the future of public transit with the head of the uh, American Public Transit Association. We did a webinar um, looking at how different cities in, in, the, in North America have opened their streets to accommodate walking and biking. And we have a working group that is focused on um, developing some technical guidance on doing traffic counting and traffic estimation in this uh, period. We've created some new engagement opportunities for our members. Um, we have do, been doing these 30 minute unstructured focus group type drop-ins. Uh, we did them daily for the first month and we're now doing them every Tuesday and Thursday. And then last week we announced a virtual annual meeting where we reimagined our annual meeting, which would be a, a typical meeting that would be in a four or five day window and we're now doing it over a three week period and organized in a totally different way to allow members uh, to engage in this annual meeting. Next slide. This is a bit of a snapshot on the impacts of COVID-19 on transportation in the United States across the various modes. And I think you can see that it, uh, it mirrors some of the information that was shown earlier in some of the earlier presentations on this topic. Um, you know, significant impact, obviously, on air travel, 
uh, with passengers you know, down in the 90% range. Dramatic impacts on the use of public transport um, down 80, 85 to 95%. On the road, um, truck travels remain pretty steady as the demand for deliveries continues, uh, but auto volumes, you know, way down in the early period for here in, in kind of late March to late April, recovering somewhat as we move into mid and late May. Uh, we've seen some significant impacts on safety with fatalities being down 8%, but the fatality rate being up 14% primarily due to much higher speeds, uh, which is a real issue for many of our states and local jurisdictions. And then I mentioned earlier opening up streets and we've seen hundreds of miles, probably about 500 miles across the US in urban core opened up for increased biking and walking. Next slide. So what are our expectations? Well, in the short term, and I define short term as the kind of the pre-vaccine period, and you know, obviously there's a lot of questions on how long that period could last. We're assuming that's you know, probably at least an eight month period and perhaps up to 18 months. And what we see right now in the US is the conditions vary um, quite dramatically across our country. Very different in some of our urban areas and some of our rural areas. Very different right now on the East Coast versus the central of the country and the West Coast. So a lot of localized um, actions and activity and we expect that to continue. Um, if we see a, a re emergence of the virus in the fall, we could see some significant closures, localized closures. We have seen a lot of work from home as, uh, as you have you know, across the world. There's been some estimation in the US that approximately a third of our workers can work from home and may continue to work from home uh, for uh, some period of time. Activity, uh, we, we see reopening, but activity is not being determined by what's opened. It's being determined by individual risk assessments. Where do I feel safe to go? Not where can I go? And obviously the activity will be generational. Uh, we see more uh, called risk taking by young people, less by older people who are more, more vulnerable. Next slide. When you translate that to transportation, these are the kinds of things that we would expect to see. That uh, overall transportation demand will remain depressed in this short term period. Air travel will be dramatically de depressed as will transit usage. Uh, biking and walking, on the other hand, will remain at elevated levels and um, there'll be increased demand for space for that. We're seeing the transition, the move to single occupant vehicle usage. And um, that is increasing, I think we will see increased mode share for throughout the short term period on single occupant usage. And I would expect the trend we're seeing in safety to continue that uh, fatalities will be down as passenger travel is down, but the fatality rate may be elevated. Next slide. So these are just some longer term questions and implications, and I won't step through all of them, but I think these are the kinds of things we need to think about even after we get to a vaccine. What do we see in terms of permanent changes in terms of tra travel? Uh, you know, not willing to travel as much long distance, shift to work from home arrangements on a more permanent basis, perhaps impact on our cities in terms of the demand for downtown office space and all the supporting elements of that. Next slide. Uh, the shift away from mass transit, is that going to be a more permanent shift and towards single occupant vehicles? The demand for more space for biking and walking? And then for, on the forefront on everyone's mind is funding for transportation. And will we see some stimulus funds in the short term? Uh, but what about the long term prospects as COVID-19 has had significant impacts on state and local budgets? and what will be the length and shape of that recovery and, and how dramatically will affect availability of funding for transportation over the long term. So these are all questions or issues that I think are unknown right now, but certainly at the forefront of everyone's mind. And my last slide just uh, provides the link to um, our webpage and our resource center uh, for more information on any of these topics. I appreciate the opportunity to share this information with you. Thank you for sharing. And um, next up, we have Police Network and Evo. 
Um, I will explain quickly what, what we do on COVID-19 and what we notice in our, in our membership. So we're a network of uh, 80, over 80 cities and regions working on, on urban mobility. Uh, next slide. What we noticed was that there's no uh, recipe for this disaster and, and we have from the start tried to gather as many best practices of cities as possible uh, and you find that also on the next slide a couple of examples um, across different modes across different uh, approaches um, creating an offer but also managing uh, public space uh, public transport as an important factor um, but uh, also having an immediate response to allow care uh, care workers, health workers to, to reach their destinations, etc. Et also cities have um, um, suspended uh, regulatory measures like uh, uh, low emission zones, parking, etc. in, in the, the deep lockdown phase. Uh, next uh, slide, please. So the what we are now in the phase we are now in, <laughs> we noticed that cities try to uh, avoid to get from lockdown to gridlock. Um, and uh, next slide, please. Um, you see that there are several measures taken to, uh, on the one hand, ensure that there is um, a uh, sufficient movement of people possible, but also that this movement can happen in a, in a safe way. Uh, and we don't want to end up in, in a situation where um, yeah, we return to um, to the, the uh, problematic situation there was uh, before the, the lockdown. Uh, in the next slide, you see uh, the results of a survey we did uh, on uh, COVID-19 and the response uh, cities have or what they expect uh, mobility will look like uh, in the months to come. There are two um, issues I want to highlight. The fact that uh, um, most of the response expect increased walking and cycling uh, but also a large share expects uh, negative effects on public transport which is is very uh, problematic of course in the next slide uh, you find a couple of examples of cities who have been uh, fast-tracking uh, plans they had anyway so uh, long-term uh, sustainable urban mobility policies that were defined have been um, implemented in a in much quicker way to uh, really push for a model shift and to allow um, in in cities to to have an, um, a better balance of space basically because um, at this moment in, in many occasions where you need social distancing um, but also where you have to compensate for an, an under usage of public transport or under availability of public transport uh, more space for active travel needs to be provided uh, next slide please so this is also the respacing is also backed up by um yeah by science and there are there's really good research done on on, on uh, understanding where um there are bottlenecks uh, where there is uh, the incapacity to have social distancing in a safe way in uh, with the current sidewalk widths etc uh, next slides please um that yeah there is this issue of uh, public transport but i think that that uh, uh Mohammed will will address that as well so i'm not going into uh, into that but we look at a really a, a huge number of of commuters or of travelers that needs to be accommodated um if not in public transport because there is less capacity or there is less uh, a perception of uh, unsafety or uh, there is an issue um we need to find ways to to accommodate uh, all these people while also having a build trust again for um for public transport um in the next slide you see that it's not all uh, doom and gloom and we have uh, we see, have seen in urban mobility that life changing events can be an important factor in changing behavior uh, a, lo a lot of cities have used this phase also to um uh, to have a trial and error experimentation. Uh, for instance, uh, huge communities have started teleworking, which is also an, uh, a factor to take into account, uh, also for the intercity uh, travel. Uh, and um, finally, I think uh, the, the idea that the, um, uh, we have been really uh, benefiting from, from um, the, the 
portfolio of solutions that is available in in cities and you see that on on this slide that the idea to to really look at a multimodal uh, urban mobility system where uh, shared systems and public transport uh, take up th their role together uh, to to carry people um, but then you need also um, yeah, public private partnerships you need different uh, uh, management models uh, data etc um, I'm concluding with the with the last slide that um, we hope that uh, and you can move on yeah so the idea that we um, that cities will bounce back I mean we we have been around for thousands of years uh, so uh, in bad and good days um, but um, we also have, have shown and specifically urban mobility departments have shown that they can act fast and, and that they have an, uh, a good resilience towards uh, finding solutions in, in, in several ways. Um, we also really see public transport as an essential service and we really need to, uh, to work, I build on that. Um, but also active travel has, has really come into the picture and you see that also in, for instance, the sales of bicycles. Um, but yeah, we need this kind of interaction between uh, government levels, uh, between public and private, and that, that's something we want to explore further in the, coming, uh, in the coming months. So in the presentation, you also find a number of, of links to, to the, the resources we have made available for, for these uh, purposes. Yeah. Thank you, Ivo. And we will move straight on to the next presenter, which is CRB and Neil Peterson. Thank you, Anna Karen. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to uh, everyone. <clears throat> so, uh, Jeff Paniari did a really good job of summarizing uh, what the impacts have been uh, in the United States uh, where we are uh, at this time. Uh, what I want to do is uh, talk primarily about what TRB is doing. I think most of you are familiar with TRB, but for any who may not be, we have three major uh, functions. Uh, convening, we're best known for our annual meeting every January with 14,000 attendees. Uh, research, we have four major research programs by mode and highways, uh, transit, uh, airports, and uh, behavioral traffic safety and uh, advising doing policy studies on behalf of the U.S. federal government. Uh, we are part of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine in the U.S. Uh, immediately after uh, COVID-19 appeared, uh, National Academies uh, set up a special committee that has been advising uh, the U.S. government on very, very fast uh, turnaround on issues associated with uh, COVID-19. We converted all of our meetings uh, to online. We postponed a uh, number of our uh, conferences, but uh, we're uh, now planning to be uh, having more conferences done uh, online. Uh, more on that in a, a minute. Uh, we've had uh, major communications uh, effort in terms of information on our website, our e-newsletter, uh, social media postings. Um, posting a lot of the type of information that uh, Jeff Paniati went over uh, as well. Uh, our uh, cooperative research programs uh, have had a number of reports that have been issued over the past several years uh, related to pandemics or emergency management that we've uh, also been featuring. And um, for those who are not familiar, we have a uh, research uh, database that has uh, one and a quarter million entries and uh, we have a website specifically for that. We've been featuring pandemic and communicable disease uh, research. Next slide, please. So uh, one of the things that we've been doing, uh, getting input from a number of different people is what are the research issues related to, uh, to COVID-19? Uh, we're up to uh, 19 pages of uh, research issues that have been identified uh, at this time. We also have a research needs uh, statements database, and we specifically set up a separate part of that for COVID-19 related uh, research. Uh, we were identifying uh, both short-term, medium-term, and long-term research projects uh, for our cooperative research uh, programs. Our highway program set aside uh, $1 million, the first 
uh, thing that is being done is to be updating the, uh, the list of research uh, issues uh, and trying to identify particularly very short-term uh, activities we can be doing related to uh, the recovery. We've challenged our 170 committees to be uh, addressing COVID-19 uh, issues through their uh, committee activities. Uh, our Marine Board, which covers uh, waterborne transportation, had a two-day session on COVID-19 that we'll make available through our webinar program. Uh, we've had uh, several webinars and have several uh, coming up. Particularly, uh, we, we had a record-setting one on supply chain issues that uh, is available for anyone that's interested that I think was very informative. We have one coming up on uh, June 1st on travel behavior issues that uh, we're trying to uh, really look into what are some of the issues that we expect over the longer term in terms of changes in uh, travel behavior. Uh, we're updating our uh, critical issues in transportation uh, document reflecting COVID-19 related uh, issues. And we're currently doing planning related to uh, our annual meeting. In uh, today's uh, e-newsletter, we announced that we are uh, expecting to be announcing a final decision on uh, whether some or, or uh, all of the meeting will be done virtually or some, or some type of uh, hybrid version uh, of it as well. And um, most of our conferences at this point in time are also uh, really looking at uh, whether they can be going virtual. Next slide. So we have had an agreement uh, with uh, PRC now for uh, several years in which we're doing a number of joint uh, activities. Uh, we track this uh, very carefully. Uh, we have liaisons between our committees and PRC uh, committees. Uh, we have, uh, have had PRC presentations during, during our annual meeting. We've done joint webinars. We'd really like to look at opportunities for more joint webinars, uh, joint committee meetings, uh, promotion of uh, each other's activities in our e-newsletters e and publications. Uh, and we have uh, just reorganized our committees and created an international council and uh, PRC will have a position, a liaison position on that uh, international council. We continue to look forward to our uh, opportunities to be doing activities together uh, with PRC. And I think I probably just about reached the end of my five minutes. Thank you. Yes, you did, Neil. Thank you very much. And before we move on, just to let you know a short update, we still have to hear from UITP, Walk 21, and then also European Investment Bank would like to say a few words from on the phone. So this means that we will, uh, we would like to, if, for those who can stay for a little while longer than our planned uh, four o'clock ending, you are very welcome to stay and discuss with us after the presentations are finished. Uh, and if you cannot stay, we completely understand. Um, but with that said, let's move, move on to the next presentation by UITP. Mohamed. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the, for the invitation and for giving me the opportunity to share with you what UITP is doing in, the, uh, in this context of COVID-19. Uh, for, 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 for those who don't know, UITP is, uh, is the Association of Public Transport, Operators, Organizing Authorities and the Supplying Industry and we are celebrating this year 135th uh, uh, anniversary and uh, we have 1,700 members in 100 countries. So I have two slides. The first one is about the lessons we have learned from this COVID-19 crisis. First is the essential role of public transport. We have seen during the lockdown that uh, the city uh, has closed, but public transport continues to be operated because it's an essential service to, to transport uh, those who have no choice, actually, and also to transport the essential workers and those who are working in the healthcare service. Uh, and uh, despite the, of course, the drop in uh, ridership, which, uh, as you have uh, heard already, uh, reached 95% in, in, uh, in some cities. Uh, uh, so an essential uh, role and uh, also now that we are uh, we are uh, uh, reopening the the cities and the the activities we have to uh, restore trust to welcome back passengers and this uh, trust restoration is uh, at two levels first is about uh, uh, restoring it uh, from a rational uh, perspective means that we have to clean to disinfect uh, uh, the public transport vehicles and the stations and this cleaning and disinfection will remain actually will stay 
in, in public transport. This is one of the silver linings of, the, of this uh, crisis. Uh, it's also about, about making this cleaning and disinfection visible to the people uh, to make them feel uh, comfortable in this and safe in this uh, public transport uh, systems. Uh, it's also about and we see different approaches in, 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 in the countries. Some uh, counties are making masks compulsory, other no. Some counties are having this uh, physical distancing compulsory, other not. So, so what's important is really that we, uh, uh, we, 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 we people feel, 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 uh, feel safe in, uh, in public transport. We consider that uh, this physical distancing should not be applied in public transport because physical distancing means a bus will only carry eight people uh, or, or a metro will only carry 100 people, which is very, very low number and which is not mass transit anymore. But when people are all wearing masks, we can relax the physical distancing uh, uh, condition. Then the need for financial support, and this is uh, uh, very important because public transport is a public service, of course, and uh, an es essential service, and it has to be supported uh, financially by the government. And uh, uh, we are, of course, communicating on, on, on that uh, because if it is not uh, supported and uh, uh, it means that uh, in some cities, public transport risk to, to, to disappear. Uh, and we have seen many cities uh, that are uh, uh, alarming, uh, alerting about, uh, about this risk. So this is, uh, this is uh, needed. And, uh, and the fourth uh, lesson is about the, the growing need to develop sustainable mobility solutions. It was mentioned already, but the climate change or the climate crisis uh, is still there. And so it's not because now uh, we, uh, we, 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 we uh, it's not because now we have this COVID-19 crisis that we should uh, forget about the, the climate crisis. And we know that COVID-19 is a respiratory disease anyway, and uh, this respiratory disease will be even uh, uh, stronger and, uh, and more serious in polluted areas and pollu polluted cities. So by, we can tackle both crises together by developing sustainable mobility solutions. Next slide, please. And so what UITP is, uh, is doing now, uh, first, we, we are developing a knowledge uh, activities and developing a knowledge about how to tackle COVID-19 in public transport uh, networks, uh, how to guarantee clean and safe operations, how to manage the demand uh, in a way to avoid crowds in the public transport systems, how to restore trust. So we are putting at the disposal of the members and also on a on the stakeholders generally, uh, a number of uh, resources, knowledge resources on our uh, website. We have also launched an exchange platform on LinkedIn, which is reserved to UITP members. And we have about uh, 800 uh, uh, members which are interacting every day, sharing experience, sharing information about, uh, about uh, COVID-19. Advocacy is of course very important. Uh, we have, uh, 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 issued open letters, uh, especially at the European uh, level, we, uh, to the European Parliament, the European Commission, or for the Council of, uh, of Ministers. We had a number of meetings with the Vice President of the European Commission, with the uh, Commissioner for Transport. Today, after this meeting, we have a, a meeting with the uh, uh, President of the Transport Committee of the European Parliament uh, to increase the awareness about the, the, the challenges in public transport and the need to support uh, public transport. And also, this crisis was an opportunity or appeared as an opportunity, I would say, to, uh, uh, to have more partnership with the sister organizations uh, and with all, uh, all other uh, associations uh, to advocate together about, uh, about the role of, uh, of public transport. We have also launched a campaign to recognize those working on the front line uh, of public transport, those guardians of mobility that are uh, advocating, uh, that are uh, uh, let's say, uh, ensuring the continuity of the, of the service, the drivers and the agents in public transport. And we wanted to recognize their essential role uh, in keeping our cities alive. And uh, we have launched a number of webinars. We have every week two or three webinars we are organizing uh, on different aspects uh, related to, uh, to, to COVID-19. Uh, webinars that are uh, giving us also the opportunity to involve much more people and this is one of the benefits of this uh, crisis also is that we have much more people involved in the, in the, in the debate and the discussion, the activities uh, from all over the world and much more uh, cooperation. So th thank you very much for, for giving me the opportunity and I am at your disposal if there is any additional questions. Thank you very much. Uh, I see in the chat that there are a few people who will need to leave us. So 
Thank you very much for joining. We will keep going, and those who can stay, please, please do stay so we can uh, wrap this up. Uh, next up, we have Walk21, and then lastly, European Investment Bank. So, Jim, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much for including us. Um, I just wanted to share a little bit about what we're doing here at Walk21. Uh, we, for people who don't know us, we've got uh, more than 5,000 uh, members working globally on issues to do with walking. And as many of you have highlighted, this is a, this is a particular moment where many of the things we've been campaigning for for the last 20 years have suddenly reached everyone's attention and they're all ringing us saying, what do we do? How do we do it? faster and uh, how can we be more impactful and it's uh, it's been a it's been a practical challenge for us to work out how to give that support uh, as practically as possible could you give the next slide please what we uh, tend to focus on when we work with cities uh, and also working um, in partnership with with governments uh, at a national level is that we're, we're always trying to set the agenda about what it is that people need to create uh, walkable cities. Uh, we make sure that we support practitioners uh, with guidance and, and hold that hand through uh, illustrating the things that to do first. And, and ultimately, we're making sure that we set some uh, indicators in a common framework for, for there to be some consistency in the way that there are definitely going to be benefits for the people who walk every day. Uh, next slide, please. What we've uh, seen, and I'm sure many of you will have had these sorts of documents uh, come across your emails and into your, into your mailboxes over the last few weeks, is that there's some really innovative organizations, uh, people like NACTO in the US, who have, have managed to believe it or not, already write down how to do it, how to convert streets. And clearly the main issue that people are, are sharing with us is, is the need to, to change capacity and make sure that when we're talking about delivering safety, um, we need to enable people to be able to go out and to make their journeys on an everyday basis as safe as possible. Now, street guidance written in the States may not be appropriate for everyone everywhere, uh, but we think it's a really useful starting point and they're, they're often leading with, with writing these things down because it, it does help inform people about understanding what it is to do and how to do it. Uh, next slide, please. One of the things we've um, been surprised about, however, is, and I think Evo referred to this, is that what we find is many people already have a cycling plan ready to go. They have a network that they've been thinking about. And from a policy point of view, they already had something ready to deliver. And, and what, we've, what we're finding is that people are just now accelerating the speed of the delivery of that. But very often these sort of network, long distance networks, sometimes cutting across whole cities, uh, five, 10 mile um, cycle routes, for instance, uh, are helpful to an extent, but actually we need to invest in what we think are three core areas, which is neighborhoods uh, where people live, uh, service destination points, which is public transport, health centers, education sites, uh, local shops, of course, uh, and then thinking also about corridors. Uh, and I'm really pleased that we've just gone after uh, Mohammed there because actually uh, the, the relationship with public transport and getting walking corridors work, working on routes where we already have public transport, where people have that familiarity of knowledge around, around those routes, we find really critical. Uh, I've shown this example here from Dublin. This, this guidance literally came out on Friday. Uh, you can download it and have a look at it. It's already 52 pages. Again, the speed that people are writing these things is really interesting. They had data. And I think to pick up Susanna's point, that was really great that they, they already knew not just how many people were using in what mode when, but also where uh, in the city. And they're using this crisis to actually understand, uh, to set a new ambition for how the city might work and, and to adapt everything that they currently do as a, as a level of service to actually change the way that the city operates. So street by street, uh, and, and this combines with uh, campaigns 
uh, and information, they are changing the way ex changing the the way that the transport is being delivered by reconfiguring space and reimagining how people are going to be practically getting about. And, and I think this is really interesting because this level of detail is really what we're having to give people uh, city by city around the world. Next slide, please. I wanted to highlight, however, and I know Rob, you're on the call from IRAP, so uh, I shouldn't really steal your data and slides here, but you know we're all friends really in, in the PIAP <laughs> system. Uh, I hope you'll forgive me. The point here is that certainly we're working in a number of places where we just don't have, uh, we didn't have safety before the pandemic and we certainly don't have safe streets uh, during, the, during it and, and we're not going to get them afterwards unless we change the paradigm and help people differently. We, uh, we know that uh, this is Rob's data. It, it's just not. It's just not safe in a lot of places. So what are we doing? Uh, we have been asked by UN Environment to work out what is going on in Africa. We really need to understand how this pandemic is being supported, or is, is how we could actually change that paradigm to actually make streets safer, faster, and accelerate the changes that we need at a policy level and in practice straight away. We're working with people like uh, Evo uh, the, with the European Commission to think about how we could create new public engagement tools, uh, innovative new tools, working with universities that would actually allow citizens to say where they don't feel safe and what it is that they want changed on the street, which is quite exciting. And, and lastly, I just wanted to share about action as well, because what we're finding, and it's a little bit of a philosophical point here, but this guy, uh, Colonel Tommy, is 100 years old, the only thing almost that he, could, he was able to still do, I know he made international news, was still walk. He raised 30 million pounds by walking around his garden and realized that that was all he could do, but it was enough to raise that money and he, he got knighted uh, just recently. But we're finding that people are saying that basically walking is the essential mobility that we have to get right before we do everything else. And in too many places, we're being called by people saying we realize we haven't yet done enough. So tell us how to help. Think about what the infrastructure is and, and let's try and reorganize things so we can get that right. And uh, we're delighted to be part of this network and, and be connected to you and your members so that we can support those people too. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. And thank you to every one of you who has contributed to this meeting with, with your presentations and your latest uh, information and thoughts on both your activities and on, on COVID and, and the impact on road and road transport. Uh, so we are over, over time. Really appreciate you for, for staying, those of you who are left. Uh, and I will just, I think, open the floor um, for anyone who wants to make a comment or question or uh, give feedback to us at PRC on what you think we should do or if there's something special you think we should address. And, and also to, for us to remind you that we are very open to, to continue discussing uh, even after this meeting and, and in different forums. So, so the floor is open. I will jump in, Patrick, here from Piak. Thank you to everyone for their excellent presentations. I think I've learned a lot. Uh, and we've organized webinars for the last two months now, more than that. Uh, uh, I think we should suddenly continue the effort of knowledge sharing. And, there's been, or there's also a case, I guess, of webinar fatigue for many people. So it's, it's going to be essential in the future uh, that we maybe try and coordinate what we do. I'm not saying that we definitely should do that forcefully, but maybe think, think about it. For example, next week we organize a, a, a webinar with our own uh, urban transport committee in, in PR. And I see that you have uh, Ivo Mohamed Mohamed, excellent presentations. So uh, if you have ideas about what we should do there, that's welcome. You are very welcome to join as well as panelists if you want to, it's next week on, Mon on Wednesday. And I uh, would be happy if you agree to add some references to your presentation today, at least if you cannot come, and I would share uh, the web links. Such things could help people navigate. I think Jeff uh, Pagnati from EIT mentioned it uh, in his presentation uh, that was really sharp on that we need to guide people, uh, uh, Susanna said that as well, we need to guide people through the, 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 
the, the, the, I mean, the, 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 the breadth uh, and, uh, and width of knowledge that is available here. So if you really want to work with us uh, on this uh, in the future, we, we are planning a, a, a report, but that's just one report. Right? We're planning a, a report this summer in the Northern Hemisphere on uh, what we have learned so far and what, what kind of recommendations we can share with our members, so mostly roads and road transport, of course. Uh, well, this is what we do. Uh, that's uh, that's really key. Uh, I started. We started the presentation today with a, a snapshot of our strategy plan. It's quite possible that some of those committees will need to adjust their terms of reference. It's not the time to say that because we don't want to overreact and to make decisions just now because we wouldn't be sure about what we want to do and what we want to change. But this is probably going to be happening all, over the next three, four months. And we'll present to our members uh, possible adjustments uh, around September, October, I would say. But if there are things that you see in about COVID, right, because this is what we have been focusing on today, some activities that you think would uh, uh, prompt you into working with PR uh, over the next years or weeks, but years as well, uh, that we welcome. And Anna Kaline would be the, the contact point for that. Having said that, uh, well, that was the first question. That was uh, the first remark. That's not always the easiest. Uh, there might be other, people, other person here in the room who might want to uh, jump in. And I would like to say hello to Justin. Justin Ward from the UK is a member of our communication commission uh, as well. And I'm glad that he could join. Thanks. So, so I'll just come in briefly, Patrick. It's, this is excellent. It really is phenomenal what you've pulled together in terms of the coverage across the world. And I expect a lot of the issues are actually very similar. So I think PIARC's playing a key role in bringing together the thinking and, and some of the ideas around about that, particularly from finance, societal issues, confidence public transport, climate crisis, and so on. So it's a, it's a great, great initiative and keen to, great opportunity to join. So thanks for, thanks for letting me in. And Rob, we see that you have raised your hand. Yeah, thank you, Anna Karin, and, and certainly been great to hear what everybody is, is up to. A couple of things just from our perspective to share is the the, the new partnership that we have with the European Investment Bank. And again, I think that's very much focused on, on building the business case for the safer infrastructure and, and obviously make sure that it contributes to that sustainable outcomes. We have similar activities happening with the Inter-American Development Bank, looking at corridors from Mexico all the way down through to Panama and looking at the, uh, the return on investment through there. Um, but in particularly for COVID, what I thought would be interesting to share is in Sweden, we launched our Vaccines for Roads uh, website, and I'll perhaps share the, the web link to go out with the, the slides after the meeting. But within that resource, we've included the injury impacts of road trauma. So not just the tragic fatalities, but the brain injuries, the quadriplegia, and all of those tragic injuries that are actually filling up hospital beds in much the same way that that obviously the COVID um, pandemic has been about managing the load on hospital systems. So I think what we have is an opportunity with stimulus packages coming out of COVID is to do a few things as, as Jim and others have mentioned is let's make sure that we get three, four and five star pedestrian and cycling facilities built. Um, find ways in which they can be built as pop-up, like the NACTO designs, and, and uh, they can work both as that urban uh, sustainable transport as well as the stimulus package to create jobs and limit that increase in fatalities and fatality rates that Jeff talked about. Um, this is a very predictable problem if we're going to increase vulnerable road users on very unsafe one and two star infrastructure. So what we can do is position the stimulus packages to um, deliver the legacy of sustainable transport and 
pre-4 and 5 star facilities for those users into the future. Uh, and, and we're also doing some work with some of the cities around the world with star rating for schools uh, to again make sure that that journey to schools, particularly as it moves more to, to foot and bicycle traffic, is, um, is at that four or five star standard for them as well. So uh, just yeah, a couple of quick introductions. And obviously, as Susanna mentioned, we've also got the exciting UN project in Tanzania where we're working together with PIARC, um, deploying the road safety manual, the IRF resources and the IRAP resources to really build a institutional outcome there in, in Tanzania in a very repeatable way that can be used in other countries all around the world. Uh, so again, a very big thank you to be part of it tonight as well. Uh, Rob, Patrick here, by the way, uh, with the chair of our road safety committee, John Milton from the USA, we've started doing a webinar on COVID-19 and road safety. And uh, if you're interested, we could share with you some information about this plan. Nothing is really decided, but it might, if you think it might make sense for us to work together on this, it might, uh, well, we'd be happy to uh, get in touch with you. Fantastic, yes, please, thank you. Same with Susanna, I suppose. Susanna, if you're on, that would be great. Uh, and uh, as yes, Patrick, sorry, I was slow in, in unmuting myself. <laughs> with pleasure, yes. I'm very slow at unmuting myself as well. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think I would like to suggest something if uh, Anna Karin agrees, that we're now nearing the end of the session and maybe we could all turn our meeting. Uh, otherwise, we will just, I think we will put on our masks in here <laughs> and we can take maybe a, a group picture if, if nothing else. But if anyone wants to add something, please, please do. Thanks again for being available and I'm really sure we'll be in touch very soon actually. Uh, maybe six months from now yeah yeah and thank you thank you everyone thank you to our pr colleagues and he, he was he was very he was very shy and not mentioned it but jeff is actually uh the the past chair of our strategic planning commission jeff in the usa so thank you everyone <laughs>